Well, we're going to be looking at uh, actually several, several passages this morning. Mike has asked me to uh, read, and I'm going to tell you what they are. First of all, we're still in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to begin at verse 28. So that's 1 Samuel 17, beginning at verse 28, and we're going to go through verse 44. Okay, beginning at verse 28. Now Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David. And he said, Why have you come down, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. But David said, What have I done now? Was it not just a question? Then he turned away from him to another and said the same thing, and the people answered the same thing as before. When the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail on account of him. Speaking of Goliath, I'm sure. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Then Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. I went after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has both killed the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head, and he clothed him with armor. And David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I can't go with these. I have not tested them. And David took them off. And he took his stick in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had, even in his pouch. And his sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. Then the Philistine came on and approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then let's look at our next passage is in 1 Corinthians, and that is 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So turn there, 1 Corinthians 4, we're going to look at verses 3 through 5. Again, this 1 Corinthians 4, chapters, or chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. But to me it is a very small thing that I should be examined by you or any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted, but the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, I do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And lastly, 1 Timothy 4. That's 1 Timothy 4, and we're going to look at just verse 12. Verse 12 of 1 Timothy 4 reads, Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Mike? Good morning. Welcome from the land of the red dirt. Uh... One of my favorite all-time quotes from Charles Haddon Spurgeon comes from a sermon entitled, Esther's Exaltation. If you're around me much, you hear it quite often. And it goes like this. If God has a purpose to serve by a man, that man will live out his day and accomplish 
the divine design. The more resistance he experiences, the more certain will his life work be achieved. David, from this point forward in our study, will meet stiff resistance from three separate personalities. And before his life work be achieved at the end of the day, he will be victorious. The three resistors all have the same responses to his fresh vitality interjected into this tense situation. And we could summarize it simply this way. You cannot possibly be serious. The great missionary Hudson Taylor wrote, Many Christians estimate difficulties in light of their own resources and attempt little and often fail in the little that they attempt. All of God's giants were weak men who did great things for God because they relied on His power and His presence with them. Here are the resistors. We see them first in the brothers, verse 28. Second, with Saul, verse 33. And the third, the giant himself, verse 43. What we want to remember from this passage this morning is all of these resistors were wrong. They were on the wrong side of history. And that's permanent, a permanent record, and they will be remembered for what fools they were. I think we can learn from the Scriptures to expect the unexpected when a man or a woman moves out by faith, laying hold of the promises of God with the power of of the Holy Spirit. And when we see that, we have a choice to make. Those who are standing near to them. We can befriend them, pray for them, support them, or be their resistors, their critics, undermine them, seek to replace them, even Betray them. But you will be on the wrong side of history if you do that. And that's a permanent record. And you will be remembered for the fool that you were. This is our tenth lesson in the rise of David, a king without a kingdom. 1 Samuel 17, and we've come to the point in the story where David, this anointed shepherd boy, has arrived at the valley of Elah on assignment from his father, bringing provisions to check on his older brothers. On his arrival, he had seen and heard the Philistine warrior. He had witnessed the terror of the men of Israel in their faces. He had heard that the king had offered a reward for anyone who would rid the land of this menace. Wealth, his daughter's hand, tax exemption for the family. And so we pick up this rather remarkable story in verse 28 with his elder brother, who is speaking, and we understand this, for all of three of the brothers in David's family. His inquiry, hearing of David speaking. Observe it's only in when David was speaking to others that he transitions into anger. 
Now, this is a very tense and critical situation. We've been 40 days and 40 nights in silence. Frankly, we're just delighted that someone in Israel's camp has a pulse at all. And so he speaks, why have you come? The exact words of Goliath in verse 8. The inspired text reads that little bit of flock. You see, David's little, his responsibility back home is little, and his current presence in this situation is of little importance. Got an older brother. Eliab says, I'm the one who knows. Now I know there are a couple of students that follow these lessons in 1 Samuel and they read the inspired text as we go through. And I would remind them without being too technical to you that you notice it's the exact same grammar in the inspired language that we have in verse 10 of the Philistine himself. It's like word for word. I meaning I myself. And so these words of Eliab, I am the one who knows. Just like the giant, authoritative, commanding, certain, and dead wrong. I think it's noteworthy that God's Word here preserves that the judgment of family, friends, members of the spiritual community are one and the same as the angry, insensitive, callous, and abrasive pagans of the world. Now, I'm going to just say this without any confusion. This has nothing to do with elders or their rule. They have very hard and difficult responsibilities. And by calling, they are to protect the flock, the sheep. And that calls for strong personalities. Convictions regarding the Word of God can be contentious and sometimes not very friendly. God bless them in their work. But what I'm referring to is personal. I've been on the wrong end of the stick sometimes from Christians. And uh, I can tell you with all candor, it's been just as vicious as anything I had in the oil business. And uh, there's some pretty tough hombres there. It's not that I'm sensitive and I don't need correction. Uh, I certainly do. But looking back over the years, I asked myself, why is it that I always felt when corrected by a man I admired most, S. Lewis Johnson, I always felt encouraged. I always felt built up. And it, isn't that what we're about here? The building up of one another in Christ? So when we reach an impasse uh, about something with another believer, I always try to listen and give a soft answer, and when we come to that dead end in the street, I just say, well, pray for me about this. And that usually sends them away. It does send them away, red-faced and shaking their heads. Look, we're all in this together to build up one another in the body of Christ. The Scriptures record here very clearly and emphatically the same opposition of the family members of David with the giant himself. Let's drill down for a moment on what Eliab is saying. The wickedness of your heart. Literally, it's insolence within 
the heart. This is the only time these two terms occur in the Bible together. So to understand Eliab precisely, let's break out the two terms individually. First, insolence. The King James translates it presumptuous. It's used of the false prophets. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if it does not happen, then the Lord has not spoken. So insolence is fraud. Insolence is deception. The second, willfulness of a heart, that phrase occurs in Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 24, and it references people who do not listen to the Word of God, but follow their own inclinations. Well, that's the book of Judges. Everybody doing what's right in their own eyes. So if we connect the dots to Eliab's argument here, it's that David is not only small and insignificant, but he's a fraud, saying things that cannot meet the standards of veracity in Israel. Pretty harsh stuff. Now, the, the Apostle Paul was often under attack, and uh, his motives were questioned, and Here's his response to that. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3-5. through 5. I care very little if I'm being judged by you or any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear. But that doesn't make me innocent. What candor this man had regarding himself. It's the Lord who judges me, he says. Therefore, judge nothing before its time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. The motives of the heart. That's where no human eye can see. I think in thinking about this, I thought of another passage. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12. Paul writing to Timothy, let no one look down on you because of your youth, but you should be an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Now, let's take that text and consider the Valley of Elah upon David's arrival. God has anointed a new king. No one knew that. And uh, he comes with zeal, passion, for a time such as this. Filled with courage. Filled with vision of what should be. Have you ever experienced like a, like a flash bulb on a camera? Somebody breaking into your day, your moment, with zeal and passion? I, I have two instances in my life that that happened. The first, uh, I, uh, my last year at seminary, there were about six of us in a class. Uh, American history with Dr. John Hanna comes into class. He's not carrying his normal books. Instead, he's got a Dallas Morning News folded under his arm. He walks in and rather than opening the class in prayer, which he always did, he opens it and he reads this article. Gentlemen, he said, last night the Dallas Police Department found an infant in a dumpster. A child of God, made in the image of God, was found in a dumpster. Now his face is red. Now his chin is quivering. And he says, gentlemen, we are under the judgment of God. 
He closed the paper and he walked out of class. I don't even remember what the subject was. But I remember that moment. We all sit there. I think I was the last to leave. I just sit there. Here's the second one. I'm sitting across from Dan Duncan in a booth, and I'm telling him about listening to uh, the show Breakpoint, Chuck Colson. And under perestroika, they had now allowed prison fellowship to visit the gulags, the prisons in Russia. So he flew to Moscow. He was driven a long distance out to this prison. And uh, they gave him this list of prisoners he could go in and see. Uh, they read off the crime, and then they opened the door. No interpretation. So there was virtually no communication. But he went in and saw their conditions, so forth. He comes to this one cell, and this prisoner, they said, has been in for 10 years for reading and preaching the Bible. Colson walks in on a dirt floor. He goes into the middle of that cell, and here's the man sitting in the shadows. And he bent down and he made the sign of the cross with his finger in the dirt. And this man got up and he retraced that sign of the cross. And about time to finish the story, suddenly, like a bear out of a cage, Dan Duncan shoots across the table with his index finger on my nose and says, that man is a king. Uh, have you ever seen those commercials where they're in front of the stereo equipment and the guy's hair's pulled back and scarf flying? <laughs> That was me. Uh, that's quite a moment. It, it, it's like uh, it's like suddenly the world is corrected, and all the farce and lies and deception are suddenly just wiped away. And this is really the truth. This is reality. The world is set right in a moment. It occurred on that moment of that morning when the money changers were just busy in their commerce when suddenly tables went flying and chairs went crashing and you could hear the sound of coins everywhere and birds fluttering off out of their cages. That's David at this moment, passionate, full of zeal. Demonstrating what the warriors should be, where Saul should be, and where the Philistine should not be in the land of promise and on the border of Judah. Verse 29, David's response is literally a word. And that is what you have. It's the word debar. It means word. And the NIV, if you have that, tries to stitch it together for us in English. Can I even speak? Or the English Standard Version, what have I done now? Was it not a word? But it's ambiguous. Uh, word, the bar can go in any direction. But here is what I don't want you to miss. Verse 30. 
David turned away from him in another direction. You see, that's always the case when criticism, when rebuke is not from the Lord. You've lost a hearing. You've lost your credibility with someone. And that is what you and I cannot afford to lose. Credibility. When we're trying to serve one another. In other words, David was undeterred. Look at that. Turning away spoke in the same manner. His brothers are just dismissed in his mind. My friends, they are on the wrong side of history. And it's a permanent record. And they will be remembered for what fools they were. Verse 31, the words David spoke were heard and reported to Saul who took them. Look at those verbs. Heard, reported, took. For nearly six weeks we've had Nothing but silence in the camp of Israel. And David's conversation naturally would go right to the top. Verse 32, Let no man's heart fail. Your servant will go and fight the Philistine. Isn't that what we've been praying for for six weeks? God has raised up someone. Verse 8, the giant called for a servant of Saul. That's who shows up. Verse 32, a servant. But look what form God's answer from the Lord comes in. And so, resistor number two. You can't possibly be serious. You're young. Well, he's been a man of war from his youth. Notice Saul's argument is not about size and shape and weaponry, but about experience. The word youth is mentioned twice. In Saul's mind, experience is what separated David from the giant. The thought of a shepherd without experience facing a trained warrior, well, that's preposterous. Verse 34, having come from the sheepfold, dressed like a shepherd, he sets forth the testimony as a shepherd. My fr Christian friends, here is your testimony. Here is my testimony. Be who you are and who God has raised you up to be. And that's what David did. This is the way God prepared him for the next thing. The lion, the bear. Common in Philistine. In Palestine. He, he killed them. He killed them at the height of their natural instinct, which was to eat. Verse 35. Here is the key word of our study this morning. Delivered, rescued. It's the verb to save in verse 47. You know, if you're an advisor, this is kind of, this is kind of what we, we kind of need here. Oh king, oh boy. You know, we need to be rescued out of this situation. More about that word when we get to verse 37. But look at the detail of his testimony. It's, it's fabulous. It's remarkable. The bear, the lion would come. So they're the aggressors. Just like the giant who comes and is the aggressor. Now look at these verbs. Caught, struck, killed. That's the display of a warrior. We got a Roy Hobbs here, another natural. Verse 36, here's the logic. The lion, the bear, 
And now for the second time, the word uncircumcised. Pagan, meaning no power but his own, shall be like one of them. In David's mind, bears, lions, giants, sack them up. They're all one and the same. Verse 37. Now, here is his close. The Lord who delivered, rescued, saved, now used for a third time. Interesting. This is the same word that the Scriptures record of Saul himself. 2 Samuel 12, 7. It is the Lord who delivered David from the hand of Saul. Also in 2 Samuel 22, 1. Now, here we have the clear issue in David's presentation. It is the Lord who rescued me in the past will rescue me again. Do you think like that? Do you think like that? If not, why not? The Apostle Paul writing to believers, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8. For I would not have you ignorant, brothers, of our troubles in Asia. We were under great pressure far beyond our ability, so that we despaired of life. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not trust in ourselves but in God who raises from the dead. Now listen to this carefully. He has delivered us from the deadly peril. That was past. He will deliver us again. That's future. And He will continue to deliver us. That's present all the way to heaven. That's your God. Now, here's what's significant about verse 37. This is the first time in the entire chapter that the covenant name, the Lord, has been used. That is the voice of the burning bush. What do we know about that? name. Well, here's what we know. That's the name that delivered Israel out of Egypt. That was the name that Joshua carried with him to conquer the land with the giants in the land. And it is the name that inspires this young shepherd boy to face a giant. What more could Saul say? But the Lord be with you. But consider the irony of that blessing, of that benediction of Saul. For you see, it is the Lord being with David that's going to cause Saul to falter and to fail. The king is the very one that pronounced his own downfall. Verse 38 and 39. Does Saul really understand what he's doing here? Saul dressed David in his garments. He tries to equip David like himself. The king placing the royal armor on the shepherd. Who we now know... The readers know he's the rightful heir to the throne. So voluntarily, he gives away to the man who is taking his place as leader over Israel. Look at this English translation. It has the word put. It's actually the verb to give. Found as you might imagine frequently in Samuel. For example, 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 4, it's used for the giving out of portions of meat. 
But in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 28, this very common verb becomes prophetic. It has an arrow attached to it. And it's aimed to a target. Here it is. 1 Samuel 15, 28. Samuel telling Saul, the Lord has turned the kingdom of Israel away from you today and has given. There it is. <coughs> Same word. Common verb to your neighbor who is better than you. Did Saul realize with the transfer of his garments what he was doing? See, in Israel, the transfer of garments is the transfer of office. Numbers chapter 20, verses 25 and 26, the Lord commanded Aaron to remove his garments and put them on his son Eliezer to become the new priest in Israel. In 1 Kings 19, Elijah comes to Elisha, the old prophet to the new, and Elijah took off his coat and put it on Elisha. The transfer of garments is the transfer of office in Israel. Give us king, shouted the people. And what do we learn? That the man who was given the office gave it away. Verse 39 Regarding Saul's armor, David says, I can't go in these now. Saul is wrong twice. Verse 33 told David he couldn't go against the Philistine. And now here David says he cannot go in this armor. The fact is, the fact is David is going to be clothed in the power of God. And my friends, that is the only armor we need, says the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6. Saul wanted David dressed like him. Saul wanted David to look like him. But David is no substitute for him. David's the real deal. God had anointed a warrior. Had given him zeal and passion. He didn't need the battlefield experience. Except what God gave him as a shepherd. And that, with God alone, will get the job done. Those are the only things that are needed. I had said it many, many times in many places. I could never have started a natural gas company in the middle of 1980 and run that gas company had I not had my seminary training in the Word of God. Verse 40, And David took his staff in his hand and picked up five smooth stones. Let me ask you, do you know where you were February 25th, 60 years ago today? I do. I was in Dallas, Texas at the trademark February 25th, 1964, out on Stimmons Expressway with a packed house and Mickey Mantle ten rows ahead of me and I was staring at the back of his head. It was the fight between Cassius Clay and Sonny Liston. <laughs> and they took the, the camera up inside the ring, and they focused it on Sonny Liston's face. He was covered in towels. And the look of that man's face, and everyone in the crowd there that night went, Oh, oh. It just swept over the crowd. But in the seventh round, the heavyweight champion of the world, Sonny Liston, stayed in his corner. 
stayed on his stool, and the fight was over. So verse 41, here comes the giant forward near David. The backside of the shield bearer is what he's looking at. And what did he see? Verse 42, he saw the same thing that the prophet Samuel saw in 1 Samuel 16, 12. Young, ruddy, handsome, young boy. Resistance number three. You cannot possibly be serious. Verse 43. Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And everybody in the camp of Israel went, Oh, oh. He cursed David by his gods. That's a waste of breath. It's a waste of all of his breath. One of the last few he's going to take. And here is the last of the threats of the monster. I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. The idea of exposure to the prey of eagles and vultures is a macabre scene of pecking away the flesh little by little by little. He taunted him. He tried to scare him. Would you be afraid? Would you be terrified? You should not be. For they that are with you are greater than all that are with them. What giants are out there barking at you? You'll fall and you'll fail. Don't you believe it? Your critics are on the wrong side of history. And that's a permanent record. And they will be remembered as the fools they are. God's power in the life of believer will prevail. He will overcome his resistors and accomplish the purpose of the divine design, said Mr. Spurgeon. God is at work among us all. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study today. Thank you for this class, for the leadership of Mark over this class. Guide, guard, and direct us and lead us always to bigger things that you have prepared for us. In Jesus' name, amen.